Commercial fishing is a complicated subject. It's a mix of politics, the environment, technology, the economy, and family and individual survival. But ask any of Maine's watermen, and chances are he or she will probably tell you it's just what they do. Maybe it's also what their parents did and what they hope their children will do. But in today's fast-changing world, there are no such guarantees. Yes, commercial fishing is complicated, a convergence of nature and humanity, of land and sea. It's hard work, dangerous, rewarding, a livelihood, a way of life, and it's on the edge of disappearing. In the early 1900s, some 300 fishing villages dotted Maine's islands. Today, there are only 15. In less than a century, there has been, quite literally, a sea change. What was once a thriving industry, employing thousands of people and sustaining hundreds of families, is now under threat. The threat comes in many forms, and it is not only local, but entirely global. The pressures faced by Maine's fishing families are the same as those seen around the country and all over the planet. Environmental degradation, depleted fishing stocks, the disconnect between legislatures and the communities they serve, skyrocketing fuel costs, and the increasing disparity between the operating costs for fishermen and the market prices for their catch. All of these conspire to erase forever, a way of life, that was once the very backbone of life along the New England coast. The island communities have been hollowed out, with younger generations looking for other, more reliable ways of making a living. No longer does a boat and a business pass without fail from generation to generation. Because to be a waterman, and whether son or daughter, they're all watermen, is simply no longer the viable trade it once was. On the Edge, our story is about all of that, but it's also about other convergences of the fine and performing arts, of commerce and community, of a writer, a painter, an actor, and the spirit of the Maine Waterman. The writer is Eva Murray, a woman who has made her life on Maine's Matanicus Island for nearly 30 years. To call Eva just a writer isn't quite fair, because like many who call Maine's islands home, She's also many other things, a teacher, a gardener, a community organizer, a baker, a medical technician, a wife, and a mother. She's also intimately familiar with the daily lives of the fishermen on Matenicus. The painter is Philip Steele. Perhaps because Phil makes his home in Southwest Harbor, Maine, and is himself a lifetime sailor, he has a keen eye for the stories of the sea. And he captures those stories in his vibrant and evocative paintings. Phil's work is part of the permanent collection at the Smithsonian Museum, and he has exhibited all over the country. His eye has been trained on many subjects, but the world at the water's edge and the faces of the people who make their lives there are by far his favorite. Here, Phil's paintings create a larger canvas, a canvas for the stage, and Ava's words capture the essence of the Maine watermen. All of this comes together in the spirit of one character, the Islander, as portrayed by actor Dennis Damon. Damon happens to also be a former Maine state senator, someone who knows the challenges faced by the island communities, so he brings a special sensitivity to his portrayal. So in words and images, here is On the Edge, a work rooted in the stories and lives of the men and women, younger and older, all of those hardy souls who have chosen life at the convergence of land and sea, who have chosen island life, Waterman All. This is about you, and it is for you. Please enjoy On the Edge. Well, good morning, folks. Hey, How are you doing? Fine, First time on the island? It is. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's quite a lot to see if you take your time to look it over. Really? Some people just yeah. come out here and they just glance around, but look under things and uh, you'll right. have a good time. We'll do that. It's a good day for it. So enjoy your time here. I'm going to go to work. Okay. Good to see you. Thank Come you. on back now. Thank you. I 
guess we made the friggin' newspapers again. <laughs> Boy, I'll be glad when this is blown over. It's getting some tiresome. Yeah, we're all just a bunch of pirates. <laughs> That's what they think. Yeah. Them newspaper people, they sure love this stuff, don't they? Of course, you know, there are some guys out here who don't mind having this reputation. Some of our island fishermen, they just assumed the rest of the world was scared of us. Too many guys want to come out here and set traps, and you know what? There they just really ain't any more room. The lobster harvest has been fairly profitable the last few years. We've had some bad times, but we've had some good times too. Some of these guys have made a lot of money over the past couple of decades. A lot of them's got a house in on the land now. They take a long time in the winter and they go south for a nice vacation. Anyway, that makes the rest of the world think they want to come here and go fishing and make money. But they don't want to live on this remote little island. Hmm. Well, sure, some of them had relatives here once, so they think they got an emotional attachment to the place, but they don't want to put their kids in school here. Some of them don't even want to set foot on the land of the island. Because <laughs> it ain't up to me to say who's an islander and who ain't. <laughs> That's a good way to get into a fight. <laughs> but you know, it's always been, if you don't live here, you can't fish here. Now, you can say what you want about that attitude, but I grew up thinking that way, and I still think that way. Hmm. The law don't exactly see it that way, though, on paper. But you know, when you talk to the, to the law enforcement guys when they're off duty, they'll tell you they understand the reasons for, for our fishing territories. And the commissioner of marine resources, he once referred to our territories as certain business practices. Trouble is, when guys start defending them with guns, that's what the headlines say anyway, they think that we're all out here shooting at each other. But I'll tell you right now, it's nowhere near that simple. The law enforcement people back on the mainland Sheriff's deputies, deputy, uh, district attorney and those people, they, they think we're nothing but a bunch of outlaws out here. <laughs> There's stories that come around. One time, uh, apparently the judge over at the county courthouse, when he had some of them lowlifes brought up in front of him, and he was going to pronounce sentence, <laughs> he says, Now, young man, you've got two choices. You can either go to jail, or you can go to Matinicus. <laughs> you know, the island I live on is 20-some-odd miles from the mainland. It really is on the edge. <laughs> it's on the edge of the state of Maine. It's on the edge of the United States. <laughs> Hell, some say it's on the edge of reality. Some people call it an isolated island, and I suppose it is, but isolation seems to me, whether or not you're isolated, seems to me to be as much a part of your psychology as it does your geography. It don't bother me none. I, I don't think about it that much. I don't lay in bed at night thinking, whoa, if I want to get up right now and go to the mall, I won't be able to. does bother some people, though. <coughs> some people think, well, what if I get sick and, and I need a doctor? Those are the practical ones. But then there's those who think that they're stuck. They think that they're stuck out here, and everything's just fine. But it's not fine enough for them. They call it stuck on the rock. <laughs> you think we was on Alcatraz or something. You know, back a hundred years ago, it was 300 people lived on this island year-round. Now, 
Oh, maybe 40, stay the winter. People used to think that it was uh, a lot more primitive back then, but I don't really think so, because they didn't have the internet. But they did do a lot more socializing. They got together, they had groups, they had clubs, they had church suppers. Every one of the houses was full, of, had a whole family living in it. You know, nowadays you can walk the length of the island in the winter, in the afternoon, and you barely see a light on. It's really too bad. Back then, <laughs> and the houses, they all had, uh, or at least they seemed to all have it, some old ladies living in them. <laughs> and they ruled this place with an iron fist. <laughs> We've lost some of that. <laughs> and you know, and the, and the schools, they, were, they had all kinds of kids in them. But we had a nurse had a general store. If you went and you wanted to order something, they didn't have it. They'd order it for you and it'd come out on the mailboat. Had a guy that had a machine shop for a while. <laughs> Hell, I even heard that we had a community band once. Up until, I think it was in the 1940s, there used to be a little bit of farming that went on on the island too. It wasn't all just fishing. There was uh, livestock, had milking cows, and they had sheep, and they had goats. Every family had a garden. All these spruce trees you see around here now, the ones that are dying and falling over, they all started, they're about the same age, and they all started in here after the livestock left. And the fields grew up into woods. I read somewhere where the old fellas, they had a rule that you had to leave enough room between buildings so you could drive a team of oxen. Made sense then. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea now. And that's what brings the summer people to say, oftentimes, well, you know, since you don't have a store, why don't you just get a cow? And then your milk would be free. <laughs> free? Yeah, I guess so, free. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, they used to haul traps out of uh, little sailboats. They were sloops, little sloops. No auxiliary power. They also hauled traps out of little rowboats. The double-enders, peapods, we call them. They built them right out here. The Matinicus Peapod was a pretty famous design. People used to go and hand line for codfish and haddock. Sometimes they'd set tub trawls for halibut. Of course they'd haul traps out of them. Now all that stuff seems to be gone and it's just, just lobsters. I remember, probably it was as recent as 25 years ago, people who had boats here and wouldn't go back into the mainland, it would take them a couple hours. Now, people make it in an hour, sometimes even less. Boats have got more power, bigger engines, go faster. We kind of do like speed, I guess, out here. Some of the guys who are so obsessed by it, they get into the, the lobster boat races that we have all along the coast. And those fellas who race those boats, they only know one speed, and that's wide open, right in the corner. You know, a lobsterman, Lobsterman doesn't have any boss other than himself and, and the weather, I guess. But they got a lot of money tied up in their boats and the, and the traps and the gear. A lot of expense. And so, when the, uh, the knees start hurting after they've been out on the water for a number of years, and that's the bad part. But the good part is, when you're out hauling traps on a nice summer morning, and it's calm, and you can see the sun rise up out of the ocean, well, that's pretty sweet. And you, you're your own boss. It's your own boat. And you're out there. 
You're out there because you want to be. Oh, sure, there's bills to be paid, but you're out there because you want to be. That's part of your life. It's a pretty good feeling. Of course, though, when the, when the wind blows and the weather gets rough and you start tossing and turning in your bunk at night and there's a storm that comes and you get up in the middle of the night and you go down to the harbor to check on your boat on the morning, there's a lot of worry. You can't afford to lose this. There's a lot of worry. It's a lot like having a kid, I guess. But then there's other times when you get up in the morning before four o'clock, it's in the summer. You look out to the east, you can see the faint stirrings of the sun that's still down. Skies showing pink. Make yourself a mug of coffee. Get into your truck, drive down the hill to the harbor. Climb down the ladder to your skiff. Take your outboard out to your boat on the mooring. A lot of other guys in the harbor doing the same thing on that hour. It's really pretty sweet. Of course, <laughs> some of the people even row, but they get there late. <laughs> you can, uh, some of the guys you'll hear, they got the tunes playing. Songs drift out over the harbor. You know how sound travels. And you can also hear, usually there's a couple of guys giving their stern man hell for something that they've done or they haven't done. You can hear the gulls wheeling and crying at each other, and the diesel engines in the boats thumping as they warm up. It's really kind of a tradition to get out of the harbor on the first light. But it's also practical, because the seas are usually calmer then. And you can get a chance to get at your work before it starts to get sloppy in the day. So with all that, you really can't blame a young fellow who's grown up with this, watching it, doing it, to want to continue to do it. Little school kids on some of these islands, they, you, you catch them, they'll be drawing pictures of the boats that they want to have when they, get, when they get grown up. They're dreaming already. And the seventh and eighth graded boys, they'll make more money lobstering, oftentimes, than, than their college educated teachers make, coming out here to teach. And it ain't just the boys. Girls are going fishing now, too, and, and the women, they're hauling. It's a real community thing. It's an important part of our economy. Hmm. Kids around here, they don't, watch their, they don't watch their dads go off to work at some job they don't understand. No. Nobody wears a suit. Nobody has a commute. Nobody works for some boss that they don't know. Nobody has a boss even, unless they're working for the uncle or maybe a neighbor. Usually, though, you do start out as a stern man. In fact, now the law requires that if you're going to get a lobster license, you have to serve an apprenticeship. That means going stern. Hmm. It ain't a bad job. You show up. It, Stern man usually does most of the work, though, I can tell you, on the boat. Not really unlike an indentured servant, I think. <laughs> but they do all the heavy lifting, and it's hard work. Sometimes it's stinky work, <laughs> but it's good work. And they get paid pretty good if there's any money to be made. And they don't have all the worry about the boat. They just show up and go to work. No resume, no background check. It makes it real handy for some of them guys the judge sends out. <laughs> the thing is, you know, that a lobster fisherman has to have access to the sea. Got to have a place, got to have a wharf where he can pile up his traps. Got to have a place where he can moor his boat, haul up his skiff. Got to have a place to park the truck. Can't do that. It's a hard job. Makes it more and more difficult. A lot of the land that used to be accessible, the shoreland, 
isn't accessible anymore for fishermen. You know, my grandfather, I was telling you about him, he, had, he moored his boat in a cove. It was about a quarter of a mile from his house. And he could sit there in his kitchen and look out through the window and see his boat swing on the mooring, pretty content, or ride hard if there's, a, if there's bad weather. But now, the main shoreline is owned by, well, sometimes they're wealthy people, but not always. Or there's condominiums that's been put up, or there's some other restrictive covenant so you can't get there. It makes it really hard. Folks, you know, they kind of want this uh, quaint and cute idea of fishermen and be able to see how a lobster fisherman works. Sometimes people come to Maine just to see that, if you can believe it. But you know what they don't want, is they don't want a pile of traps nearby because they might start smelling. And they don't want to hear the trucks going by in the morning before four o'clock going down to the harbor. And if they live near the harbor, they don't want to hear the sound of the guys giving their stern man hell and the diesels running four o'clock in the morning when we're going out to go fishing. It's getting harder and harder. You know, a lot of the land that fishermen have been using for generations was in the family, generationally. But as prices go up and taxes go up, sometimes people can't hold on to it, so they sell it. And there's plenty of people who want to buy it. They want to come and they want to build a house or a mansion. And who wouldn't? You can't blame them. Who wouldn't want to live here? It's beautiful. But at the same time, it can be a bit of a problem for the fishermen. You know, if we don't hold on to some of this very valuable shoreland, that marge between the land and the sea, that's a critical piece. If we don't have that, and people aren't able to fish that way, pretty soon we won't have fishermen. Definitely won't have lobstermen. You know, out here, there was a teacher a few years ago. She married a fisherman, and I think, uh, come to think of it, I think her grandparents might have lived out here too before she came out. But she was listening to one of these uh, armchair anthropologists that will come around once in a while. They got all the answers, you know what I mean? They, they really tell you how it's supposed to be. And, and this fellow was referring to the fishermen out here as a subculture. A subculture. <laughs> Just like it's one of them little odd groups that you might study in college or something, you know? Just a little subculture. She went up to him one day and she said, let me tell you something, chummy. <laughs> fishermen out here are not the subculture. Fishermen out here are the dominant culture. Well, he turned and went away. <laughs> this is, unfortunately, well, I'd say it's unfortunately, it might not be. This is a one industry town. In that way, it's kind of like a mill town, except it's not owned by some big faraway corporation. But every, if you don't go lobstering, there's not much for you to do here. Hmm. The young people. Most of them, they, they generally either get a boat after school and they start right in lobstering. Some of them will go off to college, but can't wait to get back here to get a boat and go lobstering. Or they have to move off, get a job ashore. It would really be great, you know, it would be wonderful if we had some plumbers, we had some carpenters, we had somebody who wanted to open the store again, we had somebody who wanted to open a restaurant, but you couldn't expect it. There's not enough business here, especially in the winter, to make a go of it. So it's really kind of a tough situation. My kids, uh, my sister's kids, though, they grew up. Um, they both went off to college. But she married a, um, 
a telephone guy worked for the phone company. So he wasn't a fisherman. So they didn't have the same connection to fishing as their buddies did. And after college, well, the girl, she's now teaching school and coaching hockey and some other things. And the boy, he, he's an electrician working at some big stadium or something out, out west. They love it here. They come back as often as they can. We'll probably see them, you know, one week or two during the summer, and they always like to come back for Christmas so we can have Christmas supper together. Hmm. It's really kind of too bad. Of course, all the kids now have to go off the island sooner than they used to because we don't have any high school here. And so for them to continue their education through grade 12, they've got to go off and, and board off. And so that gets them to a point where they're either itching to come back or their world has expanded a little beyond this island and now maybe um, their wings dry enough so they can fly. Last summer... <laughs> Last summer, this lady came out here, and she's writing something. I don't know if it was a book or an article, but she wanted to do some kind of a, a piece on island youth. And she wanted to know what our island youth were doing and how many of them were growing up to be, her words, successful. So she was asking me all kinds of questions, and I was taking her around the island, and we were down by the harbor, and I pointed out some of the boats out in the harbor. They're nice boats, new boats. Many of them are young people boats. They're starting out their career. But she kept asking, well, are any of them successful? Huh. Finally dawned on me that in order to be successful, in her definition, one of the, the kids would have to move off the island get a college education, make a lot of money working in an office. Then they would be successful. Successful to her, you couldn't get your hands dirty. <laughs> you know what? There's a lot of kids out here who have worked very hard from a young age, know what the value is of hard work, know how to save some money, know how to invest, so that they can get a boat of their own, and traps of their own, and gear of their own, and build up their own business, and then go out and work for themselves, out in the fresh air, the sunshine, the weather, make their own decisions, and really enjoy themselves while they're doing it. I think that's what might be successful in my mind. They're respected by their members of their community as well. It's another measure of success. You know, people ask all the time, do you like living on an island? <laughs> do you love it out there? I says, you know something? I absolutely love it. About 51% of the time, and that's enough to make me stay. <laughs> Another thing we've got to start realizing, it's not just us islanders either. It's people ashore. We've got to start realizing how connected everything is in this big old ocean. We've taken it for granted, I think. Of course, right now there's plenty of lobsters. But there's not always plenty of lobster bait. We catch lobsters in traps. And we, we put fish in the traps to attract the lobsters to get in. Sometimes they call forage fish. That's what the scientists call them. It could be heron, could be redfish, could be elwives, pogies, whatever. But they're not as many as they used to be. And the price, because there's not as many, the price has gone sky high. So if you can get bait, if you can't afford it, you can go to haul. But sometimes you can't even do that. And you know, there's other considerations too. 
Diesel fuel is almost five bucks a gallon. Bait, as I said, is hard to come by. And here we are, trying to do it anyway, and we're getting two bucks a pound off the boat for our lobsters. Oh, you thought we was getting more than two dollars a pound? Because you pay forty dollars for a lobster dinner somewhere in a fancy restaurant? In San Francisco, or New York, or Trenton? <laughs> Not quite so. There's a lot of people who handle those lobsters from the time that we bring them into the dock until they get on your dinner plate. And every single one of them takes a piece of that action. Now, I worry about this bait issue though. My kids think they're going to go fishing all their lives like I've done, but you know what? If those huge schools of heron that they used to write songs about, if they're not here, and they're not, that's a, that's a pretty, that's, that's that proverbial uh, canary in the coal mine. Something's going on that we've got to pay attention to. But I hope my kids can go fishing, I can only hope. <clears throat> you know, a few years ago, some of the fishermen around, they wanted to tie up their boats and not go fishing for a while. See if they could reduce the supply and that might drive up the price to them. Some people thought that that was illegal, kind of collusion. So there's been some talk, actually, about some of the fishermen forming a trade union, getting together and see if they can have a bigger impact on what they get for their catch. But fishermen, lobster fishermen especially, are a pretty independent breed. They don't like to be told what to do. And I can't imagine that they would that they would uh, band together. But we'll just have to see how that experiment works out. You know, some of the smaller islands, they're so independent that sometimes people refer, them, refer to them as uh, anarchies. <laughs> I had my friend Jim who was visiting the island uh, two years ago, I think it was. He come out from California and one night I'd taken him out to haul with me. One night we come back in and was having a few pops and he says, uh, you know, are you really an anarchist? <laughs> I said, yes, I am an anarchist, and unless there's refreshments being served and then, then I can come around some. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it don't take much. You know, they call this a simple life out here, but every little thing can sure get complicated on an island. Something that you might take for granted, like going to the grocery store to get some groceries. For us to do it, it's, it might be a special trip to the mainland, which is very, very expensive, or <laughs> one of the alternatives is to uh, stock up your, your place for the uh, end of the world like some of those conspiracy theory nuts. We all out here anyway have enough spaghetti and canned uh, baked beans to last us for six months if need be, but, but when everything has to be brought out from the mainland, groceries especially, it's not easy. You load them into your vehicle on the mainland, you get them to your boat or to the airplane if, if they're going to come out that way, uh, take them out to the island, unload them from the boat or the airplane, load them into your truck, take them to the house, unload them from the house into the pantry or to the freezer or wherever you keep them. Uh, it's not an easy job. You know, at the, at the checkout lines in the grocery stores, we often ask the bagger for two paper bags, one inside the other, and then have that inside of a plastic bag. And they usually look at us a little funny, like we're some of those uh, bag hoarders or something. <laughs> but you really got to do it that way because the bag has to be strong enough to hold up and the bottom should be waterproof if you're bringing it out on a lobster boat. So we kind of have to do it that way. On my island, 
it's pretty easy because we can put together a grocery list and then fax it into the supermarket in on the mainland. Kind of funny, out here trying to live the simple life and yet every family has a fax machine so they can order groceries. But there's a woman at the grocery store whose job it is to take care of the islanders' um, grocery orders. Judy's her name, she's a saint. I don't know what we'd do without her. She'll get the order, she'll fill it, she'll pack it into boxes, usually those banana boxes, because the boxes that banana comes in, because they're pretty strong, and, and she'll make sure that they get out to the airport, to the, to the runway, and, and onto the plane, so that they can be taken out to the island. Because if the weather's bad, we don't get our food. But if the weather's good, then the plane will take off and the dispatcher will call the houses on the island and we'll go up and meet the plane at the airstrip. And every, usually there's four or five other families who are there at the same time. They don't just come out with, with one load of groceries. And so everybody helps unload the plane, take the boxes and make sure that they get to the right truck. Everybody's helping, even, even if they're helping load somebody's groceries who they don't like. <laughs> but they help. It's part of the community. It's part of the way we have to do things here. In the northern part of the state of Maine, there's, uh, you can see it on a map sometimes, there's these squares. I think they're 36 square miles. There's six miles by six miles. They're called unorganized territories. They're mostly woods. And if people live there, there's no municipal government, so don't expect that if you have a road, you're going to get it plowed, or somebody's going to come by and pick up your trash, or you're going to have town water. There's none of that that's happening. It's an unorganized territory. It's wild. Some of the smaller islands out around here, like Creehaven, just outside of us, they're an unorganized territory as well. I got thinking about it the other day, and I think maybe I could be calling our little town a disorganized territory. <laughs> I'm sure that the selectmen wouldn't like that, though. You know, just about every able-bodied person who lives on a small island has to, at some time or other, be a first responder. If there's a fire, everybody has to be part of the volunteer fire department. Make sure we get the fire out. If, there's, uh, if you've got a boat, you can be sure that at some point during your career, you're going to have to be involved in a search for somebody who's lost or a rescue. And if, for instance, there's a hurricane that comes and, and somebody's house down near the shore, the windows blow in or, or the shingles get tore off the roof, there's always somebody up in the middle of the island where it's a little more protected who will make up a bunk on their couch and bring that family in until they can get their house fixed. That's the way we have to do it on these small islands, around any professionals who will take care of that. We have to take care of each other. One time it was January. I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was 1992. It was cold. Oh God, it was wicked cold. Wind was blowing. And just about supper time, a call came over the VHF radio that there was a construction tugboat that was going by outside of our island and they were in difficulty. They needed assistance. Well, the Coast Guard, even if they come at all, would be two or two and a half hours. So three fellows from our island went down and got in a boat, lobster boat, wooden one, good able boat, had heat on board, and those three fellows had worked together, so they made a good team. And they took off in the night. God, it was nasty. Blowing, dark, rough. The water, that, the spray that was making up was hitting the, hitting the uh, boat and freezing solid on contact. Hard for them to see. They got out there where they thought that the tug was going to be and they heard on the radio the distress turned into a mayday that the boat was sinking. I don't know how it happened, 
But there were a lot of miracles that happened that night because those three guys from Ahaba, they went out there and they found those three people. They got them out of the water before they froze to death. And so those three people from that tugboat, because of the three, I don't think heroes is too strong a word, that come from our island, there's three people who got to go home to their families, and they live to tell about it. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> and then <laughs> there was another time, this seemed to be less precarious, but nonetheless it was a rescue. It was in the summertime, it was in daylight, there was no fog, perfectly clear day, and this sailboat piled up on the rocks over by the lighthouse. Now you tell me, how the hell do you run into a lighthouse right in the middle of the daytime? <laughs> a couple of our guys went over there and they dragged the two people out of the water. There was a guy and, I don't know, I, I guess it was his secretary or something, I don't know for sure. but. <laughs> Apparently they wasn't paying close attention to where the boat was going as they should have been. <laughs> I do know that the fellow was a lot more nervous about having the account of that come into the paper than he was about losing his pretty little sailboat. <laughs> the guys around here got quite a chuckle out of it, I'll tell you that. They still do. You know, I ain't seen that guy out here at all lately. <laughs> Another time this young fisherman from the island, he went missing. He'd gone out to haul. He had an old boat just starting out. One of the other fishermen found a bunch of stuff floating, plastic, uh, dinner bucket, some oil skins, some other stuff. And so he got on the radio and called and everybody dropped what they was doing and they all came into this area, all the other fishermen in the area came searching because the people on shore they listened to the radios too and they knew what was going on so they started walking along the shorelines of our island see if we could find any see if the coast guard came the marine patrol the state police dive team airplanes circling around never found a trace you know, it still rattles people out here to this day to think of that. How can you just vanish? But speaking of the airplanes, <laughs> this happened about four years ago maybe now, three or four years ago. Not one of these, but a Cessna, a little bit smaller than that. One that had come onto and off the island literally thousands of times. Was taken off from the airstrip, had three passengers and the pilot. Something happened once she got airborne. Don't know exactly what it was, but the pilot kept his head and he kept the plane level until it hit the water. They call that a ditcher. Well, once the dispatcher back on the mainland realized what had happened, he got on the radio and all of the boats, they heard his uh, distress call, so everybody jumped back into their boats, or if they was out hauling, and they raced around to the north end of the island. Just so happens that the guy that got there first was the guy who had won the lobster boat race in Rockland earlier that summer. <laughs> but he got there and all four of them, they got all four of them out of the water. They was cold and they was wet and, and pretty stove up actually. They got them out of the water, got them to the hospital, and over time they all recovered and they all lived. But it was only by the good fortune and the, and the work of 50 or 100 civilians who dropped everything that they were doing and went to their aid. You know, <laughs> you know you live on an island when everybody will drop what they're doing to go help out, even if it's somebody they don't like. But sometimes, sometimes the worst happens and there isn't any rescue. A while back, it wasn't too long actually, we had one of the regular planes, this type here, was coming to land 
on the island had just had the pilot on board and he died in the crash. It was my friend Donnie. He was bringing a load of groceries out to the island. Sky got all funny and come kind of a freaky gust of wind or something hit him as he was coming down, turned him sideways and he went off into the woods and died. People on the island that day said they never heard a, a noise as scary as the sound of that plane when it was crashing. Everybody ran up there to help. They knew what had happened. They ran up to the airstrip, but it was too late. The Marine Patrol brought out the extrication team and, and the investigators had to look around, study everything. All the islanders could do at that point was sit with Donnie's body in the body bag on the stretcher that we took to the church. We took turns sitting with him all night long. Nobody wanted him to be alone. He was a good friend. Two days later, I had to go up and see the crash site for myself before they cleaned it up. I found uh, Donnie's glasses. I haven't been able to get rid of them. One of the most common questions we get out here on our island is, in fact, it's so common we sometimes refer to it as a numb question, but it's, uh, hey, how many people live on that island anyway? <laughs> so I've come up with a pretty stock answer. I say, well, on my island, we've got 100 people who lives here. Uh, give or take 75. quite a margin of error, but it works for me. <laughs> you know, sometimes people come to this island because they think they can run away from things. <laughs> never works, I can tell you that, it never works. Some of them are more or less running from themselves, but some of them are running from the law, or, or some of them are running from the tax man, or some of them are running from their old lady. And it ain't just the young, high-drinking ones either, or the ones who, who owe money to every store owner on the mainland. <laughs> hmm. Or the ones who come here because they know there aren't any cops out here. No, we've had school teachers and artists and educated people who come here because they want to get away from everything. Well... They get all starry-eyed about living out here on the island. It's pretty romantic to them for, for a while. And all of a sudden, the realization starts to set in that they have to haul their own kerosene in a barrel in a pickup truck. Or um, if the weather shuts in, the planes can't go, and so we really are stuck. Or the ferry boat doesn't go as often, doesn't go nearly as often as they thought it was going to go. And so all of that starts to crash in, that ugly sense of reality. Huh. Then they ain't happy. <laughs> no, they ain't happy at all. You know, they make damn miserable neighbors come February, too, when they ain't happy. <laughs> if you think you're going to run away from yourself on an island, let me just tell you something right now. You're going to run back into yourself at some point. And it's usually going to be in the middle of a march, gale, and it ain't going to be pretty. And you're going to wonder why you came after all. A lot of times we hear folks get all sentimental about uh, and say that if they was ever lucky enough to live on an island, they would never, ever, ever want to leave. 
Well, you know, that situation is true in two instances on our offshore islands. The first one is that you're there on summer vacation. And the second one is you're there because there's a bench warrant out for your arrest. <laughs> you know, we might not always get along as well as we should. Sometimes we compete with each other out on the, out on the water. Sometimes we act up a little bit in town. But there's one thing that does bring everybody together. Well, other than an emergency, that is. And that's Christmas dinner. That's a real community time out here. We have a, a supper in the, in the church basement. Everybody brings something to eat. You might get a, a fancy cheesecake from someone. You might get a deer, le a deer meat lasagna from someone else. And casseroles, every type of casserole you can imagine, held together by a common thread of lobster meat. <laughs> and pies, every size and description and taste. But they're really, really good. Everybody sits down. We have supper together. You might be sitting next to some fellow that you'd really just as soon not be sitting next to in the regular times, but on Christmas it's different. The guy across from you might be the guy that you think slashed your tires last summer just to be a jerk. <laughs> but we don't bring any of that stuff up. The guy that owes you money. Nope, nothing's ever said. It's Christmas. And we're a community. And we're sharing our supper. You know, it's really amazing about the food that comes to that supper. I think everybody... Man, woman, and child out here has a hobby of cooking. And they do a good job, most of them. Probably they have to because we don't have any takeout places. <laughs> but anyway, after we eat supper, we go upstairs in the church and we're going to have the Christmas tree. It's a big balsam fir tree that's decorated up nice. Somebody, some guy has been talked into being Santa Claus that year. And so, when the kids go upstairs, and everybody else, after supper, the guy goes into the kitchen and he gets into his Santa suit. And upstairs we're singing Christmas carols, and joyous, and everybody has, especially the kids, you can imagine the kids at Christmas have anticipation. And then we sing Jingle Bells, and that's the cue for Santa to enter. He comes in with the ho, 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 and he's throwing around bags of candy to the little kids. There's um, secret Santa gifts, too, that the adults have and, and some of the teenagers. And then, of course, there's, there's the sunbeam gifts for the grade school kids and the little ones. The sunbeam is a big boat that's part of the main seacoast mission. And they come by our island every couple of weeks. They got a nurse on board and they got a minister on board and they've always got the coffee pots full and the cookie jars are full and it's a very welcoming boat. Everybody loves to see her come. Been coming here for longer than anybody can remember. In the old days, it used to be that that was probably the only way that the real isolated kids, the lighthouse keepers' kids and such, could get their Christmas present or even their school books came on the sunbeam. Its presents were always wrapped up in white butcher paper, butcher paper with a red, little simple red string. Usually there's a hand-knit pair of mittens or a beanie or a scarf and maybe a little bit of candy. Sometimes there's a toy. It's simple stuff, but it's thoughtful and really appreciated. So with all that, a lot of times out here it's every man for himself. But it's the things like Christmas, the simple things that 
keeps us feeling like a community and makes us know that even though we're stuck on the rock, we're stuck together. Every man for himself, perhaps, but through good times and bad, through all kinds of weather, literally, these island communities have hung on for hundreds of years. They have clung to these rocky islands as a way of life, together. But the question in today's world is, can they still do that? Should they? Do they want to? We don't presume to answer those questions here, but it's good enough for now that we all start thinking about them. Think about them the next time you drive a scant 15 minutes to a grocery store to find fresh New England seafood in the cases. Think about them the next time you order Maine lobster at a favorite restaurant. Think about them the next time you visit a quaint island village, maybe without thinking too much about the people who call that place home. Then think about the people, the watermen and their families, who make all those pleasures possible for you. Think about the realities of life on an island, those stories we've shared with you here, and what it means for lives and livelihoods to be at risk every day. Think about what that means to our history and our future as a nation. Do we want to see all that go away? So talk to your neighbors, your legislatures, and think about what those purchases mean at restaurants and stores. Talk about life on an island and how important those little places out on the edge of the world are to all of us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us out here on the edge. Thank you.